coming up on today's show. Tomahawk Live is one week away, and we announce a star-studded guest list that you don't want to miss. We've got Cleveland Browns legends, former NFL star receivers, and national TV personalities. And that's just you and me, Hawk. Dislocated elbows, WWE tag team ideas, and we debut this week's Tomahawk catchphrase. Good luck fitting this one into the Thursday Night Football, Joe. All of this and much, much more coming up on another award-winning episode of The Tomahawk Show. Welcome to The Tomahawk Show, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your host, Andrew Hawkins, joined as always by my guy, Joe Thomas, the legend, the Cleveland native, not a native, but he did play 10,000 snaps in the city of Cleveland, Ohio, so that makes him a legend on the Tomahawk Show. Joe, how you doing today? I'm good. I always think of myself as kind of like a dual citizen, you know, like uh, Russian slash Azerbaijan. Uh, yeah. It's a dual citizenship because I lived in my entire childhood in Wisconsin. And then when I turned 22, I got drafted by the Browns and lived the majority of my adulthood in Cleveland, in Ohio. So three of my kids were born in Ohio. I, I feel like there's a solid connection between uh, with both cities. So there you uh, go. You, feel free to call me an Ohio native if you want. No, like that's fine. Because it's funny. I do the same thing. People ask me where I'm from and I say Ohio, even though I was born and raised in Pennsylvania. I went to college, obviously, at 18. And I was in Ohio all the way till I was 33. So I lived literally half my life in Ohio and half in Pennsylvania. So I'm the same way. Being a savant like yourself, though, it's not obvious you went to college when you were 18. I mean, I think a lot of Tomahawk (laughs) listeners out there probably thought you went to college like Doogie Howser at 16. Well, I could have because I was a genius. And that's why. Because of your height is what you were thinking, really. More More than your IQ. So if you're just now tuning in, this is why the Tomahawk show is so, uh, fantastic and why we've won so many awards including the pebble beach conquers the elegance best of show award so oh. that's another one we've added to the repertoire here's a fun fact that's about me joe one. i began playing football in fourth grade but didn't play my first football game until fifth grade here's why fourth grade is when you were allowed to start to play football so i played tackle you're saying here tackle football fourth through sixth grade so the sixth graders are huge compared to fourth graders which is probably not <laughs> smart anyway but anyway i'm on the team i'm quick i'm obviously tiny like bite size status but i'm a little oh, i'm a fire starter and i'm a crack oh, i'm a firecracker anyway so right before my first game i'm playing basketball at the ymca right no scratch that i'm swimming at the ymca i hate swimming. Ah. Fun fact now I know me. this is a fake story because I know you don't swim. Well, let me finish. You, I hate you, swimming. You like your steaks well done and you don't swim. I hate, You're just a walking stereotype. I hate stereotype. being in water for more than four, hour, four minutes. Four hours might be a little okay. long. More than four <laughs> minutes. So all my buddies anyway. are swimming. I get out. I'm like, you know, I'm going to go shoot some hoops. Very stereotypical. So I go on the basketball <laughs> Three court. for three here today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm shooting hoops. But the gymnastics class is coming up next. So, like, all the gymnastics equipment is out. There's a balance beam right in front of the hoop. And I would always go on the balance beam, <coughs> jump up, and dunk. So I was literally climbing up on the balance beam, jumping, dunking with two hands, let go, fall 10 feet, get the ball, do it again. So I'm up there. I'm in there by myself. A guy, is there's a track over top. He's running around the track. I'm sitting there with the ball. He looks down. I'm, like, scared, like, oh, snap. He's gonna get, I'm going to get in trouble. And he's like, <laughs> what are you waiting on? Are you scared? And I'm like, no. I jump up. I don't make it over the rim. I hit the rim with the ball. I go flying backwards. Sprite style. Fall on the balance beam. Then hit the ground. Right? I'm embarrassed. Like, similarly, when I got hit by a car in my last story. I get up, and I'm like, oh, man. I think I'm good. So I go to adjust my hat, and my right arm doesn't raise. So only my left arm comes up. And I'm like, wait a minute. Try it again. And I look down and I can't move my arm. So I start running around the gym yelling, I'm paralyzed, right? <laughs> because my arm isn't moving. I'm in fourth grade. The guy up, tar- up top starts freaking out. He runs downstairs. I'm screaming, I'm paralyzed. My arm is going back and forth, wiggling. So I look down. By the time somebody comes in, my elbow is on my shoulder. I dislocated my elbow all the way to the top of my shoulder. So my arm wasn't moving. Go to the oh hospital, gosh. ended up getting surgery, dislocated elbow, broken arm, didn't play my fourth grade season of football. And that's why I started in fifth grade. And that's how I had my first bone break. What kind of surgery did you have? Um, I don't know. I was in fourth grade. But here's the scar. 
I'm showing the studio right now for everyone listening. The mm-hmm. scar. Nasty. And I thought that because, you know, Rookie of the Year was a big movie at this time. So even in that, I'm like, oh, when oh, I come I back, I'm going to have a can in. <laughs> Woo! That was not the case. That wasn't legit. And here we are. If you're just now joining the show, if this is the first time you've ever listened, make sure you subscribe and rate the podcast five stars. Everyone else who listens has already done it. That's why we have seven million reviews on Apple Podcasts. Follow us on social media, on Reddit, on Twitter, on Instagram, at Tomahawk Show. Join our Facebook group, Tomahawk, or call our voicemail line, 440 628 one three seven six. We do a video show every week, every Sunday, and it's time to talk about the most important thing in our lives, Joe. Mm. Not football, not mm. our families, not our mm. children. Tomahawk Live, November thirteenth. Okay, we are going to announce the guests for tonight for our one hundredth episode celebration. That's in Cleveland, um, at the House of Blues. Doors open at seven. But before we announce the guests, let's talk about Omax. Hawk, today's episode is sponsored by Omax. You can visit them, omaxhealth.com, and enter code Tomahawk to get 20% off. Mm. And like all of our products, when our great marketing team comes to us and says, yep. hey, we got a potential endorser here. Do you think we just jump? No. Nope. We say, yeah, whatever it is. It doesn't matter. It's all about the money here at the Tomahawk Show. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> what we say is you need to first send me your product, and I need to try it. Because I do this podcast for fun. This is not my job. This is a hobby. So I'm not going to endorse some BS product that doesn't work. We make $20 million an episode. Yeah. So I've got some lingering pain from my days in the NFL. Obviously, I had to retire because of a lot of joint pain in my left knee. And mm-hmm. uh, my last game of the NFL, I tore my tricep tendon. And I have a lot of pain and stiffness in my left elbow still. And so being a guy that likes to work out, I like to get in the pool. I like to bench press a little bit. Now that I'm retired, I don't do a whole lot of squats. So I like to get on that bench. And you know what? Yeah. After doing a lot of bench press and a lot of swimming, my elbow gets really sore. And so Omax sent me some of their roll-on CBD and I put it on my elbow one night and sure enough, the next morning <laughs> I woke up, I felt amazing, so amazing. I went back and bench pressed two days in a row. So let me tell you, oh, if you want to be able to hit upper body every single day in a row in the weight room, make sure you are using the Omax Health Roll-On CBD Stick because I tell you what, it actually really works. And with this bad elbow that I've had since fourth grade, Ooh. I might have to try the Cryo Freeze Pain Relief Roll-On from OmaxHealth.com. But you know what? Omax Health is offering our listeners 20% off a full bottle of Cryo Freeze Pain Relief Roll-On, plus free shipping. The discount applies to any product on the site, so go check them out. Hit OmaxHealth.com today, enter Tomahawk, and take advantage of the 20% off. And you know, Hawk, one thing I loved about that Omax Roll-On CBD Pain Relief was it was working within 10 minutes of putting it on my elbow. And I feel wow. like the relief, it was like taking an Aleve. You know how like an Aleve lasts a lot longer than a Tylenol or an Advil? This stuff works up to eight hours. So you can put it on before you go to bed and when you wake up in the morning, your body part is gonna be feeling amazing. And you can throw it on again once more in the morning before you go to the gym or before you go to work and you're gonna be feeling great the entire day. So not only does it feel good quickly, but the relief lasts a long time. Don't let muscle soreness stop you from living an active lifestyle. Go to omaxhealth.com, enter code Tomahawk and feel relief faster. And now the moment everybody has been waiting for 1113 Tomahawk Live, House of Blues, Cleveland. If you haven't gotten your tickets, what are you, an idiot? Go to Ticketmaster or House of Blues Cleveland or hit up our Twitter page and hit the link in the bio. It's there. It's our 100th episode. You've been here for 100th episodes and you won't come to the live show? Well, this might change your mind because we are officially announcing the guest that we have locked for our live show. Coming in at six foot one, 210 pounds on a good day. I actually have no idea if that's right. Cleveland Browns legend tied the NFL record for kickoff returns. Touchdowns? My first time hosting. The greatest special team intern in the history of the Cleveland Browns. And someone that deserves to be in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. We got Josh Cribbs in the building. The crowd goes round. Josh Cribbs is someone everyone is super excited about. Me too. I grew up a Josh Cribbs fan because I was a Mac receiver. But anyway, to continue the hosting role, next, 
We have another dual position athlete, a two-time Big Ten champion at the Ohio State University. I'm slurring. It's the coffee. The best Cleveland Brown to ever play quarterback and wide receiver by a long shot. We got Terrell Pryor joining us for our live show. Terrell is an Ohio favorite. He's much like me. Grew up in Pennsylvania, moved to Ohio, found a home. He refused to go in a game one time at quarterback, but that was fine because they weren't paying him enough money. We'll talk about that. Live, 11-13 in Cleveland. Joe, who we got next? The next gentleman I have the great pleasure of introducing was part of one of the greatest offensive lines in the history of the NFL, but still managed to finish 4-12 and 5-11 and and nearly every season he was a Cleveland Brown. He finished among the highest ranked guards in the entire NFL during the 2012 season. He is not the same guy who invented the Greco-Roman wrestling, but he is the greatest chef that I know that did not go to culinary school. And he is one of Youngstown's finest gentlemen. His name, John, not the wrestler, Greco. Greco is actually the reason this podcast exists because he was the bridge between me and Joe Thomas. So it's it's crucial that he's a part of our 100th episode celebration. Next up, we have 2011 Brown's first round draft pick. Started every single game as a rookie. Played collegiate football at Baylor University. Also, Greco played at Toledo. I went to Toledo. This is not the right place to say that, but I wanted to get it out. Back to this current guest. Finished his Browns career with seven sacks and 69 tackles. And when I first met him, when I signed with the Browns in 2014, he said, you're a fast little shit, aren't you? Phil Taylor will be joining us at the House of Blues in Cleveland on 11-13. The next person on the list is another short slot receiver that I love to hate Not before I got the opportunity Not to meet slot, him slot, slot. and start to share <laughs> stories and break bread and enjoy fine meals on the road together. He is a five-time pro bowler, a three-time all pro wide receiver in my book. He is easily a hall of famer. He's done it at every single level for multiple teams. One of the most dynamic personalities in NFL history. Just ask the top 100 NFL personalities special that's <laughs> playing on NFL Network right now. He is the current All-Pro at reacting to my hot takes on Thursday night football kickoff. He is Steve Smith. Senior, 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 senior. senior. And now... The multi-talented host of the NFL Network shows Good Morning Football and Thursday Night Football broadcast alongside Joe Thomas, Steve Smith, and Michael Irvin. She's the leader of the Tomahawk catchphrase game. Someone you can't measure with an abacus. Someone who is not a cucumber scientist but puts everybody in a pickle. (laughs) Someone who gets her money's worth. He's practicing already. Someone who knows Papa don't play that. Someone who's willing to risk it for the biscuit. Colleen Wolf will be joining us in Cleveland, 11 13. The Lone Wolf. The Lone Wolf. That was exhausting. But yeah, Colleen will be there. That's a pretty good lineup. Tomahawk and Friends, 100th episode. As the kids say, shit's lit. That, that's loaded, and it's definitely slanted Browns heavy because it's going to be primarily a Browns conversation Absolutely. during this podcast. It's going to be Browns centric because, of course, we are in the city where it started just a few short years ago, the Emmy Award winning, Academy Award nominated Mm. Tomahawk Show is coming back to where it was created. Cleveland, Ohio. And it's cool because listen, we actually are gonna announce some more names. Those are just the ones we for sure know are coming right now. We're going out to a couple more people this week that'll wrap it all up. We're going to be talking. It's going to be awesome. With with Cribs, we're going to do a whole campaign segment around why he should be in the Hall of Fame because I truly believe that. And of course, we're going to have him sitting right there to join us in that conversation. We're going to talk about the Browns 2014 season. Since we have a couple people who were members of that team, let's get to the bottom of what ha- actually happened that year. And more importantly, we're going to play the Tomahawk drinking game, um, which at the end of the night, we'll have everybody using their Uber code that we will not be providing. Got to get that on your own. We don't have that kind of money. (laughs) All right, that does it for the guest list. Time for us to pick six. One, two, three, four, five, six, six. This is pick six. 
Guys, the first question comes from the taller of the trees on Instagram. Mm. He wants to know, what's the hardest hit you've ever laid on anyone? Mm, the hardest hit I've ever laid on anyone. Joe, I know you have a bunch of them. I don't have many, mm. so I'm going to go first. <laughs> we were playing on Thursday night football against the Ravens, maybe? I don't remember. Who do we play in 2016? Thursday night football. Researchers are on that. Long story short, we were running the ball. There was a linebacker about to make a tackle, I think, on Duke Johnson. And I laid this dude out, like pancaked him, and he was so mad. And I stood over top of him for a second, like just to let him know, like, hey, just so you know, the smallest guy in the NFL just pancaked you. It's not going to be fun in the in the film room next week. He was pissed. And then he was headhunting me the rest of the game. But that was my hardest hit. Who do we play against? Ravens. Ravens. There it is. I knew I knew I had purple in my mind for a reason. Joe, your hardest hit? So if you remember the hit, there's two that, that always stick out in my mind. Um, coincidentally, they were both from college. But one was, we used to run this play at Wisconsin. We called it like a uh, whammer screen. And uh, I think that's all we called it because we only ran it to me. It was trying to highlight my Outland Trophy <laughs> uh, credentials to try to get me to win that thing because you know as an offensive lineman we don't have many highlights but if you go and you you murder some poor unsuspecting cornerback that's going to make the highlight real you know it's going to sway voters who probably don't really watch uh much film of offensive line play anyway right, right. so we used to run this whammer screen where we would start a zone play to the right and i would take three steps to the right and then i would turn and quickly do a 180 and run flat down the line of scrimmage so the receiver would push up three steps and then he would he would stop and back up and catch like a little smoke screen right uh -huh. and if they were in man coverage um, the cornerback would be looking right at the receiver and he'd see him push up. So he'd start to backpedal. All of a sudden he'd see him try to catch the smoke and he would try to come up and make a tackle. And we had a time perfectly and we ran it only on one hash or the other. I don't remember if it was the short side or the, or the wide side, but um, by the time I took three steps inside and then turned and came flat down the line of scrimmage, I was going to hit that cornerback a split second before he was able to make the tackle on the smoke screen. And we were playing against Bowling Green. Sorry, Ohio people. Uh, we did it against the the Patsies from uh, Bowling, Bowling Green, Green over there. You know that's our uh, rival at Toledo, Joe. Did you know that? I know because you guys are right down the road from each we're other. We're literally 15 minutes away, so I have no problem yeah, so, with killing Yeah, Bowling so Green. I don't even remember the name of the poor cornerback, but I basically took three quick steps, and I started running as fast as I could. And back in those days, I was still fast. I was 21 years old, so I could still giddy up down the line of scrimmage. And I was a pretty big guy, too. I was, you know, 312 or whatever. Uh -huh. And I, back in those days, I would have definitely got, like, a targeting, but it was not such a thing back then because I just ran straight down. I put my head down, and I led with – the triangle, the my two hands and the crown of my helmet. Ooh, and I illegal. just smoked this dude. I felt so bad because, you know, he's coming up to make a tackle. He doesn't see me at all. I'm running full speed, 4'9", 320 pounds, That's 312 moving. pounds, right down the line of scrimmage, and I cleaned him. And it was one of those where I hit him so hard and I was moving so fast with so much momentum that I didn't even slow down. I didn't even feel the hit. It was like he was there and I totally vaporized his body <laughs> and his head because I hit the side of his head. <laughs> and I remember very distinctly the 84,000 people in Camp Randall Stadium all going, <gasps> at the same moment that I hit this poor kid. And of course it went for like 20 yards. And I think till this day when I came back and I was recognized for going into the College Football Hall of Fame, they played that play on my highlight reel at Camp Randall Stadium uh, during yeah. the game. So that was pretty cool. It gave me goosebumps. Um, and then the, the second biggest hit was actually on a defensive lineman. It was on an interception. Finally, picking and it was on someone your own side. Purdue, yeah. It was against Purdue, but it was the same type of thing where this poor defensive lineman's, it was an interception. He's leading the interceptor down the, the sideline, and I'm coming from an angle, and he sees me, but I've got a little bit better angle on him. You know, like, if you're running straight, you're going to have a lot more momentum and because he's kind of running on a little bit of an angle, but he sees me, and he tries to block me, but I'm running full speed, and I kind of lowered my chicken wing, and I gave him a chicken wing right in like shoulder side of the head area uh -huh. and i hit him so hard i was about four yards from the sideline and i hit him so hard he flew through the air into the white on, oh, wow. on the out of bounds side and he skidded about another three or four yards and i didn't make the tackle but i hit him so hard that i cleared the way that we were able to make the tackle behind him so those are the two biggest hits that i can remember in my career wow so basically you are the number one cause of cte in college football 
Yeah, yeah th- those two guys definitely had significant concussions, but they're actually saying CTE is caused by repetitive trauma, not the one concussive mm. blow anymore. Yeah. Uh, that's not as bad as people want to think. It's it's just those repetitive sub-concussive hits that linemen get all the time. So you're good, yeah, you and really I'm screwed. You got technical in that one, and I was just trying to make a good punchline joke. All right, what's Four. the next one, John? <laughs> Cody Wright on Facebook asks, how long until we see Joe Thomas transition to the WWE? I think he could cut some pretty good promos and would look good in a feathery boa. Um, <laughs> this question isn't directed towards me, but I will say I couldn't agree more. Joe Thomas mm. is tailor-made yes. for WWE wrestling from his personality to his height. He's like seven feet nine. People don't realize how tall he is. He's <laughs> That's what now. I would be in, in wrestling because they kind of exaggerate. So. Yeah, so he's seven feet nine. Uh he has obviously the personality, the voice down packed. Everything, every time he does a read, we just announced the guest earlier in the show. He sound like an, a WWE pro. So whatever we got to do to make that happen, I am all for. Maybe you got to play in the XFL first, Joe. Yeah, it's interesting. Actually, this past off season, uh, Hulk Hogan. I got to meet him in Cleveland, and um, him and his manager were kind of talking to me a little bit in the off season about doing some type of WWE promotion. Uh, synergy between us and it never came to fruition but uh, there was definitely some conversation surrounding it and uh, we'll see I think depending on how Gronk does and how he's received they might be more willing to dip into the football players because I think as football players we're obviously physically on the level of those wrestlers and we also are used to trying to be showmen a little bit because being guys that have their helmets on all the time we have to kind of go out of our way to show our personality whether that be on twitter or off the field like you see gronk doing uh and so i think we're used to being a little bit of a showboat which is exactly what the wwe is all about so uh, basically what i'm trying to say is next week will be my first wrestling match and i'm really excited (laughs) to be involved with the gronkowski and the wwe and how about thanks for the question me and you start a a wrestling tag team when we come out and i'm on your shoulders oh i'm crouched down on both your shoulders over top and we just walk out and we're the 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 fucking the tomahawk the the tomahawk you know what we need to get is like we need to get a, a ginormous sparkly robe, you know, like one that's yep. glittery, but it only goes over your shoulders, right. but it's long enough where it completely covers me. So all they see is like my massive veiny calves, right? And then me uh, just... white veiny calves. And then you're like a uh, small black head. That's like 14 <laughs> feet tall at that time. Uh, I think that would be a great entrance to the ring. See We're how gonna... we could like somehow Get, get underneath those ropes <laughs> without getting off my shoulders. We're going to have our creative team get started in those costumes now. What would you guys' finishing moves be? Finishing mm, moves. That's be, that's between me and Hawk and uh, our we, opponent. We would we would roll on a CBD cryo freeze <laughs> pain reliever because we would obviously be sore from a whole wrestling match. Jeez, could you imagine yeah. us trying to recover from a wrestling match? Oh, my God. We are We'd old. We'd be able to wrestle joints. once a year. <laughs> All right. What do we got next? Tad Millington on Instagram asks, any good ideas to cure a hangover after a Browns loss? Oh, man. Joe? The problem with the Browns hangovers this year is that they've been more than physical. They've been mental. So not only are you hung over from drinking too much, but you're hung over from just feeling emotionally drained and pissed off. And so I think the only solution is more alcohol. Really, what you want to do is you want to <laughs> okay. cure your hangover <laughs> with a Bloody right Mary. In. Yeah. Yeah. Bloody Mary, so you need to hair the dog that bit you a little bit, and then you need a nice strip of bacon and a fully loaded uh, Bloody Mary, all the way from an olive, a pickle, a piece of celery, a nice cube of a nice cheddar cheese would be delicious. And, uh, of course, the strip of bacon would be important. That's I've, that's how you cure a Browns hangover. I've never had a Bloody Mary. You need one. Maybe a Tomahawk Live. All right. But it's a morning drink, so maybe the, the morning after. Is it a morning drink? You know what we call morning drinks where I'm from? Alcoholics. <laughs> That's what we call. That's what we call people who drink in the mornings. Hawk, let's talk about ExpressVPN. In case you're not familiar, a VPN or virtual private network is a secure tunnel between your device and the internet. VPNs are used to protect your online traffic from snooping, interference, and censorship. ExpressVPN leads the VPN industry in privacy research and cutting-edge leak prevention. ExpressVPN can also act as a proxy, allowing you to mask or change your location and surf the web anonymously from wherever you want. It also comes with apps for computers, mobile, and digital media players like Fire TV. 
Plus, use ExpressVPN every time you go online to keep all your network data encrypted and secure and safe from hackers. ExpressVPN is the fastest VPN I've tried. Costs less than $7 a month and comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Protect your online activity today and find out how you can get three months free at expressvpn.com slash tomahawk. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash tomahawk for three months free with a one-year package. Visit expressvpn.com slash tomahawk to learn more. All right, what do you got, John? The next question comes from our voicemail line. Hey, Joe Hawk, this is Trey, longtime listener. I was curious, if you guys both came out of retirement today and tried to play each other's positions, who do you think would be more successful, Joe at wide receiver or Hawk at left tackle? Joe Hawk yourself. There is only one right answer to this, and it's me. Oh, Not mm-hmm. because I'm so humble. That is not the reason. The reason being <laughs> is I've actually gained the weight needed for a left tackle. <laughs> so it would actually make I'll me give you I'm, that. I'm better at left tackle now than I would have been as a player where Joe's knees knees have gotten worse so he mm. couldn't play slot with his knee situation so I'm actually I'm actually on my way to becoming a probably pretty good left tackle just in general <laughs> so you could be like Shaq Mason from the Patriots, who's like five nine, but he's about three ten. So you got to gain a lot more weight. I You're uh, 190 pounds of chub right now, but you need about <laughs> another 120 pounds. I'm not exactly sure where you're going to fit that in, but clearly the right answer is me, and I'll tell you why. Because uh, I don't have good hands. I can't run at all. No. And the only thing I could do though is a little bit of blocking. Which and is so whatever, at least I could. That's cover. what everyone wants out of their slot receiver. By the way, can I just say well, that? Well, I would say that uh, for you, you can't pass block and you can't run block so you can't do anything that is required of an offensive tackle but for me at the very least you could put me in there and i could dig out a safety and the safeties would not want to see me although they would never actually make contact with me because they would be, be way quick quicker get there yeah. i would not be quick enough to get there in time <laughs> and even if i was they would just olay me instantly so uh i think it's still me by a sliver what about when they do the tackle pass because then I become I guess, a very coveted left tackle. Yeah, but as soon as you're an eligible receiver, that's going to be a little obvious. They're so? going to be bringing people in there to cover you. Also, do you remember um, a certain offensive coordinator that we had that would always motion me down to help block with the best pass rush at the end? You probably don't. It never that worked. Was your best, that was your best attribute in the NFL. It was, I was a blocking slot. So essentially, sure. you're just a better version of what, you know what? I already was. Is that what you're trying to say? uh, Yeah. You know what? He can't really catch, and, uh, you know, he's not really good at running. But I tell you what, he can really help block those (laughs) premier pass rushers when you motion him down the three times a game. Oh, man. It hurts because it's true. What's next, John? Brian Homeyer on Facebook has a question for Joe. When you put so much into studying and refining your technique as an O-lineman, how do you feel about people referring to other position groups as, quote, skill positions? I actually like it because us as offensive linemen, we consider ourselves mushrooms. We consider ourselves the mushroom society and we become almost infatuated with the fact that we get no respect and we get nothing but blame. And so I think it becomes this little like brotherhood where we actually enjoy being called like the big guys and other people are the skill positions. Um, I don't know. It, it's kind of weird. It goes back to the NFL saying embrace the suck. You know, as an offensive lineman, your job sucks. You have no glory whatsoever. The only thing you can do on game day is get penalties or give up big plays, big sacks, big hits. And when things go well, they interview the receiver, the quarterback, the defensive end that gets the sack, the running back. And when things go bad, you know who they interview? The crappy left tackle that gives up the sack (laughs) or the center who snapped the ball over his quarterback's head and lost the game. So it, it almost becomes this like little secret society that actually they enjoy the fact that we are everybody's bitch. So do you realize for like the, when you say the old NFL saying embrace the suck, a lot of people have never heard that before. And that's such a regular term in locker room, similar to a quarterback seeing ghosts. I was so shocked mm. when the fact that Darnold said he was seeing ghosts blew up because I've yeah. heard it so much that it just became normal to me. And even now people are still talking about it, making jokes about it. And it's like, the Jets were mad that it got out, and I'm like, yo, that is normal. But I guess, does that make me weird, or does that make no. everyone else crazy? Well, that's the crazy thing about the NFL. It is like this 
secret society. And I think that's why the players are so close and it's such a brotherhood of people that have played in the NFL because you have all these issues that you deal with together as a football player and you even have your own terminology and lingo that's very common. Like right. in our position group or even in the offensive meeting room, we'd talk about seeing ghosts and chasing ghosts. Like seeing ghosts was seeing something that wasn't there or overthinking, um, overthinking something. Yep. And then chasing ghosts was like if you're in a meeting and it's Friday afternoon and you start coming up with all these what if scenarios that the defense doesn't even do. Like, yep. what if they bring the both corners and they blitz the safety? Like, how are we going to pick that up in this pressure? And you can waste a lot of time going into a game day, especially as game is a, as the game is approaching by chasing ghosts and things that the defense isn't even going to do to you. And that's like a classic offensive lineman or an offensive line coach <sighs> Uh, foible is you're chasing ghosts. You're wasting so much time on things that aren't going to happen. Let's focus on how do we handle things that are actually going to happen to us. And it's just common in the offensive linemen in the NFL lexicon to talk about chasing ghosts and seeing ghosts that it's, it was funny to every player that I talked to that was in the NFL that made it such a big deal when Sam Donald says he was seeing ghosts, because that's our way of saying that he was seeing things out there and he thought things were going to happen that didn't happen. Yeah. And I think that's truly why the Jets allowed it to go out there because they didn't think it was a big deal. But people out there that have never played in the NFL, that have never played high-level football, never heard it before. Right. And they thought it was this great <laughs> reveal that Sam Darnold was basically like <laughs> submitting to the game of life. Like, <laughs> I have given up. I'm seeing ghosts out there and I can never be a quarterback. Like, they thought this was some <laughs> big reveal from Sam Darnold and uh, it's actually become pop culture now. You hear people talking about it and it has become something that it never was. But that's why NFL players are so resistant to allowing media in the locker room, to allowing microphones on the field yep. because there's like this secret society that exists in the NFL in the locker room in, amongst teams that unless you live a year in an NFL player's shoes, you have no concept and you don't understand how to properly contextualize the conversations that are happening and they're going on on a daily basis. Right. And if he was seeing actual ghosts, yes, that would mess up his rhythm. <laughs> Furthermore, I mean, give the guy a break. He's playing against extra players. It's like angels in the outfield, except football. Yeah. All right, what do we got next, John? Galio2 on Instagram wants to know, Hawk, what should Joe's punishment be for interrupting you and taking your downs on run pass option? Death. Hmm. Very simple answer. He should be killed, but we won't allow that. So let's figure out some different way to punish him for taking downs during run pass option. What do you got? Do you have a suggestion, John? I don't have a suggestion. I'll Joe, leave it up to you. Joe, punish yourself. It's, what What is your punishment? Well, well, here's what I'm going to say. I think what we should do is we should put it out on social to our Tomahawk uh, okay. listeners, the Tomahawk, because they are so creative and they're so good at coming up with catchphrases and all these different things that we proposition them with that I think it only makes sense to allow them to pick my punishment when I interrupt you on run pass option. All right. And we're on the uninterrupted network, so that's like double whammy. That is the most not uninterrupted thing ever to interrupt me. <laughs> all right. Uh, Extra point. All right, we got an extra point. Extra point. Today's extra point also comes from the voicemail line. Thomas Price, formerly from Lorain, Ohio. The thing a lot about the past and how the game has developed as far as the passing game. So I got a question for you two NFL geniuses. Who from the past as quarterback do you think would find the most success in today's style of gameplay? We had a conversation about this at work, and we proposed the idea that Brett Favre would not have made it in today's NFL. Thought while you go Joe Hawk. Before I let Joe answer this question, he said he was formerly of Lorraine, right? How are you formerly from a place? Does it change? <laughs> do you, like, all of a sudden become from a different place? We talked about us both feeling like we're from both places. Do we now say... I'm formerly from Pennsylvania or formerly from Wisconsin. We're now both from Ohio. I don't know. Just curious. So what's the proper way to say it? Formerly of Lorraine? Yeah, formerly of Lorraine. Because you're always just, from somewhere, but you're just not Just from wherever there. you're from. You're not formally from a place unless it yeah, changes. Formerly of Lorraine. Okay, well, thanks for really breaking down the uh, English language for us today. That was crucial. Yeah, I mean, come on. It's audio. All right, Joe, what do you got? Who? 
So I actually think that's a bad take because Brett Favre was actually a pretty mobile quarterback. He wasn't Lamar Jackson or anything like that, but he could move around a little bit. He could scramble. And I think today's quarterbacks are proving if you want to have success in the NFL, you've got to be absolutely generationally elite as a Mm -hmm. pocket passer. Tom Brady, Drew Brees, Phillip Rivers. Or you have to be able to throw and have the threat of running. Not necessarily like, design runs like Lamar Jackson, but Deshaun Watson, Russell Wilson, being able to extend plays with your feet and scramble when necessary to get a first down because that adds such a difficult to mention for defenses to handle when as a quarterback, you are able to escape the pocket and maybe get a first down or at least draw the defense and gives your receivers time to get open uh, because defenses don't account a player for the quarterback in most defenses unless you're playing like a Lamar Jackson. And so that guy, if he's able to escape the pass rush and get out, there's nobody that's accounting for him. And that's why you see Deshaun Watsons and Russell Wilson, Patrick Mahomes, and on down the line having such great success in today's game, extending the play with their feet. I'm going to go with two. I'm going to go with Dan Marino, who wasn't very mobile, but his arm oh, was, he was just so live. Awful. Yeah. So he reminds me of Mahomes because, like, Mahomes is, as from an arm standpoint, is like the next Marino. And I think Marino, because he was such a live arm, he would still thrive in today's NFL. Second, I'm going to go with Randall Cunningham. And it's funny because you mentioned that. Yeah. It's it's weird just being like, if you have if you if your team is a team with a guy who just sits in the pocket, you feel like you're at a disadvantage. Like now, like in today's NFL, in 2019, you're like, oh, man. Well, my guy just drops back and passes. Like, there's nothing sexy about that. Like, whenever when you're watching the Deshaun Watsons and, you know, Russell Wilsons and the Patrick Mahomes and the Lamar Jackson, these guys are running all over, and it's dynamic, and it's exciting. And, like, people are literally watching football more because I feel like the game is just exciting. Even Josh Allen is a dual-threat quarterback, right? He's a big guy, but he's athletic, and he runs. And, uh, yeah, I just – I would say Randall Cunningham was a guy that was before his time. I realized after you said Randall Cunningham that all I did was refute Mr. Lorraine, Ohio, formerly, uh, saying that Brett Favre would not be a good quarterback in today's NFL. I'll give you two. One, Steve Young, incredibly mobile, yep. great passer, mm-hmm. would be really good in today's NFL. And actually, John Elway, he could move around pretty good, especially early on in his career. He was in that uh, Mike Shanahan scheme when he was really excelling, and he could run. He was a, a pretty athletic right. quarterback until his last uh, years in the <laughs> NFL when he just got a little older. But um, I think those two guys would do exceptionally well in today's NFL. I like those takes. I like this text. And thanks for the fan question. I know we're just joking. You know we love you. Love you, Tom O'Clock. All right, before we wrap, Joe, it is time to reveal the winner of this week's Tomahawk catchphrase. Wesley James on Facebook. He was the guy who submitted. We changed it. We put a little spin on it. But the catchphrase for the week is, I'm not a cucumber scientist, but they sure are in a pickle. How are you feeling about the chances you're able to work this into your Thursday night football Boy. podcast? Yeah. Um, I feel pretty good. I think I can work it in there. You know, the, the last few weeks have been some of my best work yet. <laughs> and I went in with one strategy and I had to change it right in the middle, which is what any good analyst is able to do. Right. You know, you're no, able to think on the fly and change. And actually the change usually has worked out for the better. So I've got a few ideas. I'm not going to spoil them right now. Um, but I definitely think that we can work that in there. It's a big game. You Raiders, know, Chargers, these are two teams struggling to keep their playoff hopes alive in yeah, the AFC and the lights West. On. And the lights on. Yeah, the Chargers, they're both, shoot, they're going to be in London changing. next year, maybe Germany, who knows? The, the, the owner did come out and say, we're not effing leaving L.A. We're going to be here for a very long time, period. <laughs> so, Do you know what? Do you know what that makes me – think of is Nick Saban. Remember when he was with the Dolphins? Yeah. You know, somebody that denies something so fervently reminds me of, what is it, a Shakespeare saying that thou that dost protest too profusely? Like, 
he was really trying <laughs> to shoot that down and clearly uh there was probably some truth to the rumor and maybe it wouldn't be his decision but the nfl certainly does not like seeing the the charger stadium right now stub hub arena or whatever it's called yeah. uh be filled with the away teams every single week and can you imagine what that's going to look like in the new la stadium yep. when there's what 60 70 80 thousand seats and there's 2,000 Chargers fans and there's 15, 20,000 away team fans. It's going to look like a high school playoff game. Right. I mean, it's, it is not a good look. And I think maybe well, they should move back to St. Louis. There's a lot of St. Louis fans maybe. of our podcast and they are constantly hitting me up talking about, hey, <laughs> Chargers to St. Back. Louis. We will embrace them. Bring us a team. We love NFL football. Uh, well, look, I'm no cucumber scientist, but it sure seems that the Chargers are in a pickle. Uh, Joe, the, the reason why you're the winner of the Tomahawk phrase week in, week out is because you add a little flair to it. We all know I'm going to get it in my broadcast because I will randomly just say it in the middle of anything at any point in time, and it doesn't matter. To, like I will literally check that box at any point in time, and everyone around me who doesn't know the game is being played will just look at me like, why the hell do we hire this guy? And I will just continue on with the broadcast as if nothing happened. You, though, you put a lot of thought into it. You put energy into it. You put effort into it. You game plan how to use it to make it make sense. And that's what makes you special, my friend. There's no doubt it's the most important part of my day. On Thursdays, <laughs> the first thing I think about when I wake up at 3.30 in the morning to get Ooh. my grind on, hashtag grind, which is not true. I actually <laughs> sleep in on Thursdays because I got to stay up late. Uh but honestly, I do think about it a lot. We always have a production meeting at 9 or 10 in the morning to get ready for the night's show. And most of my notes are about how I'm going to fit in the Tomahawk <laughs> catchphrase. <laughs> Just doodles in, in the Tomahawk catchphrase. All right. Well, that does it for this episode of the Tomahawk Show. Again, I got a list going on. But uh, our live show is 1113. House of Blues, Cleveland, 7 p.m. Doors open. Get your tickets at Ticketmaster, House of Blues Cleveland, or hit up our Twitter page, and the link in the bio will take you right there. We got incredible guests. We got Josh Cribbs. We got Terrell Pryor. We got Phil Taylor, John Greco, legendary Steve Smith, and Colleen Wolf Locked. We will announce more guests as we get closer. Joe, what are your final thoughts? So, as we were talking about this weekend, I had a little boys' weekend at the farm. We were knitting and crocheting and uh, doing some puzzles. And one of my buddies, a close friend from high school, is a fireman. He's a fireman in uh, the Milwaukee area. And he told us a great story that I thought I'd share, since usually my final thoughts are football related, but I thought you'd get a little kick out of this. Yeah. He said that last week, somebody called 911 and reported that they were starving to death and they needed <laughs> help immediately. And now you can initially think about like, wow, like there's people that are clearly hungry in this country and you know they're not doing so well right no no this was just a drunk dude at red lobster who <laughs> called 911 because his food was taking too long and he wanted to tell them that he was starving to death uh -huh. so hawk i can promise you one thing when we go back next wednesday to the city where it all began and i take the tom of hawk out for dinner to some uh -huh. of the great restaurants in Cleveland, you will not have to call 911 <laughs> and say that you're starving to death because I guarantee when you walk in, when I'm in charge of our dinner date, there will be food on the table and there will be drink ready when you walk in that door. So no calling 911 on my dinner party. I love it. Uh, are you going to eat a well done tomahawk steak with me? I can guarantee if my steak comes out one degree over medium <laughs> rare, I will send it right back. <laughs> No oh, soup for you. I love it. All right. Well, look, that's going to do it for this episode. Joe, take us out. Joe Hawk yourself. <laughs>